Shannon's Lumber Industry Update. Today we're on episode 73, and I don't know what to call this one. It's kind of catching up on some emails, but I'm going to be updating the world on plywood, specifically the Russian plywood deal, and uh, giving a little bit of feedback from previous episodes and answering some questions along the way. So, yeah, I, it's a grab bag episode. That's what we'll call it. It's it's called I've Been Out of My Inbox for a Little While. I need to catch up on some of it. So, well, speaking of the inbox, thank you to everybody who's filling my inbox. Um, a lot of you are patrons of the show. Uh, I love that. Thank you so much for sponsoring the show, supporting the show. If you want to be cool like them, go to patreon.com slash lumber update, and you can be a monthly sponsor, annual sponsor, whatever. A buck, two bucks, doesn't matter. It all helps. It's all greatly appreciated. So thank you, everybody. So let's, uh, let's talk some industry news. All anybody can talk about and all my inbox seems to talk about, is Russian birch. What's going on? Well, obviously, the Ukrainian war is awful and terrible, and there's boycotts of Russian products happening all across the globe, rightfully so. And it is making it difficult. As I spoke about in previous episode, um, the Russians comprise 10% of the plywood market. They are also the largest exporter of wood products in the world. So... whether they're making the plywood or they're exporting birch, Russian birch, to make other things, it's quite a bottleneck in the supply chain. And it's causing problems in a lot of other industries because what we don't, what you may not realize is birch plywood is kind of the unseen product just behind a lot of things. Just about every engineered floor product out there has a birch plywood core to it. So I know the company I work for, we're not, you know, really big plywood people. We do a a fair amount of marine plywood, but that's kind of our niche because we have a boat builder market we work for. But um, we we sell a lot of hardwood to floor manufacturers. And that's kind of gummed up the works because they don't need any hardwood because they don't have any substrate to put the existing hardwood they have on it. And it's really stalled the entire flooring industry. And you think about it, the flooring industry stalls, that stalls out the finishing of lots and lots and lots of home products and things like that. Um, <clears throat> these shop plywoods are the mainstay of cabinetry, kitchen cabinets. The guys who make carcasses, drawer boxes, all that stuff is done in birch. All the way down to children's toys are made out of birch. So much comes out of birch plywood and It's causing a major, major problem across multiple industries. So I'm getting email after email, Instagram messages, Twitter messages. What's going on? Well, not not what's going on. Everybody understands what's going on. Nobody's happy about the price increases. But what's nice as compared to like the COVID pandemic and the supply chain thing is people are upset about price increases, but they're kind of like, well, it's okay because the war in Ukraine is terrible. People are dying. This is awful. We'll suck it up. And in many instances, Russian birch is available, but people are just saying, no, I'm not going to buy it. I'm not going to support the Russian economy. So we're not buying any Russian products at all. So unlike COVID and the supply chain, it's not like there's an an unavailability of the product. It's just, no, we're not going to support that economy and, and more power to you in that. So people keep asking me, what is an alternative product? And I've seen um, a couple of products made by Columbia Forest Products thrown around. Um, Apple Ply keeps coming up, um, which, by the way, folks, Apple Ply is not extinct. Um, Apple Ply was a separate brand that was bought by States Industries. And for a couple of years, they kind of stopped producing it. Um, It is still a product. It's a very limited run product. But because of that limited run nature, I don't know that that's an alternative. In many instances, that product uses uh, maple uh, inner plies. Um, it's a heavier panel. Um, <clears throat> frankly, it's not as good. Well, it's a great panel, but for what Baltic birch, I'm speaking that generically, just it's easier to just say Baltic birch. The role that Baltic birch plays in the market and the price point that Baltic birch lives at, that that's part and parcel. You can't just say, 
yes, here's an alternative product, but it's three times the price. That's not an alternative um, for what we're using shop grade, aka Baltic birch plywood for. And an apple ply or many of the panels made by States Industries can stack up quality and some instances may even be better quality because there's more than just one grade of Baltic birch. But the the volume of it that's available is not there, nor is the price point. The stuff that Columbia Forest Products is producing is the same thing. And in many instances, it comes down to the raw material. When you look at the continent of Asia, with the northern part of it being Russia, all of Siberia, and all of that massive boreal forest up there, it is perfect, perfect material for Baltic birch plywood. That's one of the reasons Baltic birch is like synonymous, synonymous, that's a word, if I can pronounce it correctly, synonymous with shop plywood. Birch plywood, Baltic birch, all that. Finnish birch gets lumped into Baltic birch. I mean, technically it's made on the Baltic. But it that species and that particular growth of trees, that ecosystem, that boreal forest is absolutely perfect for this. And Finland was producing some of it. They have some of that same forest, but obviously to a much lesser degree. So when you look at the alternative products being made, they're not using Russian boreal birch. That's not their raw material. They may be using birch because we have birch all across North America, but it's just not the same. It's like saying the teak grown in Africa is the same as the teak grown in Myanmar. It's just not the same. Genuine mahogany is not African mahogany. Um, Genuine mahogany grown in Fiji is not genuine mahogany grown in, you know, Latin America. They are the exact same species, Sweetina macrophylla, but they are different working properties. Um, uh, Tectona grandis, uh, teak, grown in Africa on plantation, it does not hold a candle to Tectona grandis grown in Myanmar. It's just the way things are. Different climate, different forest, all that stuff. So the Russian birch is pulling from a massive inventory of incredibly high quality birch, Russian birch. And they're able to produce, you know, zero voids, in many instances, zero seams in the plies. Um, And let's be real, at a much lower price point because the labor pool is very, very different up there. So I hate to tell you this, folks, there is no alternative. And I've heard several people, I myself, a couple episodes said, I think this is an opportunity for a company to step forward and take that 10% market share. Nobody wants to do it. Because the reality is, hopefully, let's cross our fingers, the Ukrainian war is not going to last forever. Hopefully, it will be over soon. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to immediately go, okay, start buying Russian materials again. There's going to be a boycott for a while. There's going to be a sour taste left in a lot of people's mouths for a while. But the Russian birch is going to come back into vogue at some point. Now, is that six months from now? Is that five years from now? I don't know. But when you think about if I'm a manufacturer, let's just let's put Columbia Forest on the spot. If I'm Columbia Forest Products and I'm thinking, okay, we're going to build a Russian birch or a, a, a Finnish birch or Baltic birch panel that competes on quality and on price point and, and make up all just make a duplicate panel and match that price point. What do we have to do to do that? And it's a major capital investment. It may require shutting down a production line, which is producing money at this point. So you lose that revenue stream. You have the turnover time. Then you got to figure out how to make all this stuff work, bring in this material to create a duplicate panel, and you've got to get the market to accept that. Now, granted, everybody's just scrambling for an alternative, so it might be a little bit easier, but it's still a stubborn market because so many manufacturers are relying upon that birch plywood as the core, the substrate, literally, of their engineered floor, of their cabinets, whatever it is they're making. And if that isn't good, the whole product is crappy. So it's kind of a linchpin for a lot of these folks. So if I'm looking at, if I'm Columbia Forest and saying, I'm going to do this, how much money is it going to cost us to get a line up and running? How long is it going to take us to do that? If it takes us six months to a year to do that, what's to say that by the time we're up and running, the Russian birch isn't flowing again? And now we're having to compete directly against this machine that has the ability to maybe, if necessary, push, reduce prices or ship more or flood the market because they've got so much inventory. They've got so much ability to produce this because they have been the plywood producer for birch plywood for so many years. 
It's the big bear to compete against, and it's going to be particularly difficult. So it's a major, major risk for a company like this who may already have massively stretched supply chain and trying to figure out how they're going to pull this off. So what you're seeing is a lot of manufacturers are kind of all looking at one another and kind of saying, well, you go first. <laughs> no, you go first. Um, there's a lot of other factors that come into play that you know, not just the competition, but you know what kind of blowback if the Russian market comes back online, um, you know, that's a really well-established market. I'm not going to talk about the Russian mafia, but, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of things that make for a very, very big risk for an established manufacturer to just start producing a shop-grade plywood. Now, certainly there's some that are already producing a shop-grade plywood, and that's where we go back to things like Apple Ply and the variety of products Columbia Forest makes. What you have to do if you're looking for an alternative product, go back to my plywood episode. You've got to figure out what's important to you. No panel is going to meet every single need. And certain panels are going to be great for what you relied on for Baltic Birch and bad for other things. You have to figure out what's going to be most important. Is it stability? Is it weight? Is it zero voids? All of those things are going to play some sort of priority in whatever product it is you're making. you got to figure that out and you got to go to your manufacturers. The one thing you can say is there is a, a very clear market need. So you can go to a manufacturer and say, look, I've got to replace my, my Baltic Birch. What do you have for me? And more than likely, they may have four or five different panels that they can talk to you about. And they'll be able to tell you this is one this one's good at, this one's not good at this, et cetera, et cetera. But I would not hang your hat on the fact that someone's going to come step forward and replace the flow of Baltic Birch. I would love to be proven wrong. But it is a really, really risky situation. So unfortunately for everybody who's emailing me saying, what's an alternative product? What do we do? What do we do? I don't have any answers for you. Nobody has answers at this point. And it is hurting multiple markets in a very, very big way. So all we can do is kind of wait and see and pay three times the cost of what we're paying for plywood. Believe me, it's going on everywhere. Our marine suppliers, marine plywood suppliers have increased 60, 80, uh, close to 300%. You know, we get a 60% increase, then an 80% increase on top of that. We're up over 380% in the last couple of years. It's just nuts. But what do you do? It's a very specific product. And, you know, <laughs> if there's only a few people making it, they can name what they can. And I don't even necessarily think that there's major price gouging going on. It's, you know, massive supply chain issues, massive raw material delay, problems, um, manufacturing problems, all that that are driving these costs up. So yeah, sorry to be doom and gloom, folks, but let's remember there's a war going on. So I understand that it's painful, but it's not that painful. So not to be indelicate, we got to suck it up um, and try to find an alternative. And if people are listening to this and they have found an alternative, write in, let me know. Let me know what that alternative is, what your experience with it is. It's not like fishing holes, folks. Don't be afraid to give up your source. Um, cause the more we can support whomever's making that alternative, the greater, the greater the chances that they're going to be able to survive. They're going to be able to beef up production, increase their, their facilities and things like that. So I would love to hear from folks who found an alternative. Uh, let's move into some feedback here. <clears throat> Martin wrote in, uh, he was listening to episode 70 and he says, um, uh, you're right that people, uh, always want to talk about workbenches in one way or another, why we built them, uh, why we did the one we were supposed to do and et cetera. But he said in discussing local, t local timber around Nebraska, you meaning me expressed surprise at the presence of bald cypress trees. As someone who spent 30 years uh, in Oklahoma, I can tell you they're quite common down on the prairie. Carl Whitcomb, an arborist at Oklahoma State University and author of You Know It and Grow It, the guidebook to plants on the Southern Plains, lists bald cypress as one of the best trees to plant. It's resistant to many diseases, it's attractive, and best of all, it can tolerate heat, the bad clay soil, and even drought. There are usual, um, there are usual cypresses you see all along the edge of ponds and rivers, but there are also loads that thrive in cities and people's yards. I myself planted several at a horse stable where no other tree, excepting the Chinese pistache, had survived for more than two or three summers. 
Good to know, Martin. Um, yeah, I, I think of Cyprus as in like Mediterranean Cyprus uh, when I was in Greece and Italy, or I think of like Leland Cyprus, bald Cyprus, like down on the bayou. I don't think of it in dry, dusty prairie land. So good to know. It's just a particularly um, hardy tree. Thank you for that feedback. This one's interesting. Phil um, is an architect, and he said, uh, um, as the occasional salvager of fallen timber, um, I'm a big fan of your last couple episodes of the Lumber Update. Um, they have started to cross over into topics that are really valuable to my day job as an architect. Um, he's a senior principal at a, at a DC firm, actually, and they spent a lot of time detailing millwork and working with contractors to get their projects through construction. The recent episode with Cambian Carbon um, was like music to my ears. I had several opportunities to work with local mobile sawyers to salvage some great fallen timber of a 200-year-old red oak uh, to use personally, and have long thought how great it would be to organize and connect all of the folks working with urban timber into a more accessible market for furniture makers and mill workers. Our office in particular has recently designed a new studio space for ourselves that is under construction and our experience trying to look for ways to use locally salvaged lumber exemplifies what I think is the biggest single obstacle to widespread use of urban timber in commercial millwork. And that's plywood. Interestingly enough, after our plywood discussion, in commercial design, the vast majority of millwork is custom veneer casework, and the entire ecosystem of millwork contractors is set up to crank out CNC cut plywood based millwork clad in whatever fancy veneer the architect specifies. Solid wood is largely relegated to wood base and edge banding. For our office, we look for opportunities to possibly use solid salvage timber for the tops of our sit stand desks, and we're willing to pay the premium associated, but the company producing the workstations was unwilling to warranty a solid wood top for fear of wood movement causing unforeseen issues. So I would be interested to hear your thoughts and also Ben and Paul from Campaign Carbon on how we need to change how we architects design so we create opportunities for salvage timber beyond the lobby feature walls and one-off conference tables. As you all mentioned, aesthetic tastes are shifting to favor the raw beauty of imperfect wood, but I have a hard time seeing how we can fully take advantage of that shift in the commercial office market. Very, very good point, Phil. And I will, I will back this up by saying I've had many an architect say the same thing to me. And many an architecture millwork house who, like, if there's not plywood involved, sorry, we can't warranty that or we're not able to work with that. Or, you know, yeah, we can put veneer. He's absolutely right. Plywood is literally the substrate of the entire market. So it is a particularly difficult stumbling block. And it's kind of funny because before plywood, we all did it as solid wood. Architects dealt with it before. The times have shifted away from that. And, and especially in the CNC world where so much mass production is happening, it's a very difficult argument to fight. Now, the one thing I'll say is with plywood being so expensive and so difficult to get, it might be an easier market um, to break into, uh, to educate at this point. And that is probably why... Um, it is all feature walls and conference tables. You're absolutely right. You walk into these 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 buildings and they have this gorgeous reclaimed whatever feature wall, and then they have like a conference table, but everything else is you know Herman Miller <laughs> press board cubicles, and he, nobody's really designing beyond that. Maybe the occasional hardwood baseboard molding or something like that. So I don't know the answer to this, and I'll tell you, um, I have a salesperson I work with with our millwork house. That, whose job is to work directly with architects and, and, and work on specifying and kind of value engineering things. And it's a constant battle to figure this out. The interest is there in using these reclaimed or salvaged or urban timbers and or maybe lesser known timbers. But when it comes to brass tacks and figuring out how to actually integrate it into a design, it's, it is interesting. And I think um, Phil, you're asking the right question. How do we as architects design to better use this information? So Ben, Paul, if you're listening, you guys said you listened to the show. I would love to hear your take on this. Um, and I, I'm probably going to email them directly and say, listen to the show, because I would love to know. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to keep asking that. Um, every architect I talk to, I would, I would love to hear your feedback. So if there are other architects listening, 
How do you design to incorporate this? Have you had any successes with it? I know of a lot of companies who've had successes with very particular products and designing around them and kind of using them as focal points. Heck, I do that all the time. I find a beautiful piece of hardware, like a cool drawer pool, and I'll build an entire you know case around that. So somebody must be able to think this way. And I think maybe knowing that there's going to be more urban lumber available might be the impetus to get people to start thinking about designing differently. But again, don't have the answer, but I am particularly interested in, in finding out what that answer would be. More than likely, it's going to be a long, slow kind of education process that will allow people to start designing and thinking about how do we get away from our reliance on plywood and start using more of this other natural material that grows literally on the street corner. All right, enough of that. Let's move on to some questions here. Um, Josh wrote in and he says, I've sat through a couple of meetings uh, a couple of weeks ago at work about the difficulty of procuring large pieces of wood to cradle a ship headed into dry dock. Obviously, the 20 inch by 20 inch blocks can't just be picked up at Home Depot. I wanted to know if there are special rules for sales to the government. With most other products, a few companies seem to specialize in dealing with the Byzantine rules of the bureaucracy of government sales. And I was also wondering if the same holds true for the lumber industry. Absolutely, Josh. Um, I know my company, we've sold to the government on a number of occasions. We've done work with the architect for the Capitol for many, many years. Um, We've certainly done business with the DOT, DOD and the military, with the Department of Transportation. Um, fallen off in recent years, but ultimately you got to have a GSA number. Um, you know, there are ways to work around not having a GSA number by contracting with somebody who does, but you've got to be an approved vendor for the government, no matter what it is you're selling. And in the lumber industry in particular, FSC comes into a major, major play. Now it's not all FSC because you can't get everything FSC, but there's a lot of sustainability concerns and a lot of of stipulations that have to be met in the contracts with government um, projects. Not only having that GSA number and just being able to sell to the government, but being able to supply the very, very specific specifications they have for the lumber. In many instances, those specifications are not realistic. Like they're specking something that's only possible with an engineered material, not an organic material. So it can be very difficult, but it is certainly possible. Um, We've sold blocks like you're talking about, not recently, but back in World War II, to the United States Navy. Um, <laughs> that's not going to help you very much now, but yes, absolutely. You, you got to get your GSA number to do that. Um, Brian has an interesting question. <clears throat> he says, I'm expecting my first child this May, and I would like to potentially plant a tree to make a piece of furniture for her at a later age, thinking high school graduation or college slash wedding. My parents live on a wooded 15-acre lot, and unless something unfortunate happens, they will be there for the foreseeable future. So it will be going there and not at my current home. So my question is whether it's possible to have a domestic hardwood tree go from sapling to harvestable lumber in 18 to 20 years. My father's on board, but neither one of us know anything about silviculture beyond him having trees taken down every few years that are dead. Um, This is in southern New Hampshire. They already have black cherry growing a lot in abundance, so that was my first instinct. But I don't know what the timeline would be on how much upkeep it required to be reasonably sure it will produce usable lumber. Um, He does joke at the end. He says, my parents have been there 35 years. Don't plan to move. But if there's anyone in the real estate industry listening to the podcast that has ever seen a right to harvest this tree included in the home sale, I'm all ears. That's interesting. I'm actually going to ask my mom. She's been a real estate broker for, for decades. Um, I suppose you could put anything into a contract as a matter of somebody getting to accept it. So um, first things first, softwoods, they're certainly going to grow a lot faster. So I wouldn't necessarily discount them. He does specifically say hardwood. If it were me, I would want to plant a hardwood, a hardwood. A softwood will certainly get to harvestable lumber um, for a project in 18, 20 years. So that is certainly an option. Um, There are a couple of resources you can look at. The National Forest Service has done several kind of annual growth rate uh, charts and things like that that the talk about percentage of growth rate. Um, But I actually found an interesting website um, that I'm actually gonna link in the show notes. Um, It's the Missouri Department of Conservation that has a tree growth um, uh, uh, chart here. Uh, The Forest Products Laboratory talks in terms of percentages. So they'll say, you know, uh, a red oak has an annual growth rate of 3.75%. Black cherry, 5.11%. So 
you know, pine, 5.6%, poplar, 4.2%. You know, that's good to know, but what does that really tell us? Um, so certainly if you planted a sapling and certainly if you already have cherry thriving on, on the grounds, it, it's a good sign that cherry is going to do well. So if you plant a cherry and it's, you know, one inch wide, one inch diameter sapling, do the math, you know, what's it going to look like with a 5% growth on top of that? Well, what does that 5% growth mean? Is that vertically? Is that diameter of the trunk? It's not really clear. So the Missouri Department of Conservation <clears throat> is actually talking in terms of feet, linear feet of growth. So for instance, the sycamore tree can grow to be over 60 feet, does well in wet soil, likes partial sun, and it's listed as fast growth. Fast growth meaning has the potential to grow 24 inches or more annually. Slow growth has an annual growth increment of 12 inches or less, while medium growth is between 12 and 24 inches of growth per year. So that makes a little bit more, we can relate to that. You know, we can relate to it's going to be a, a one foot tall sapling in a year, it's going to be three feet tall. So in 10 years, if it's growing two feet, you know, two feet per year in 10 years, it's going to be 20 feet tall. So that being said, you know, the, the fast growth trees, 24 inches or more annually, would be a good bet. So let's look on here and see if we can find black cherry. Um, wow, there are a lot of trees on this list. Um, and I'm probably looking right past black cherry. No, black gum, black hall, black locust, black oak, black walnut. Well, look, black walnut is listed as medium. So that's going to go between one to two feet a year. So in 20 years, you're going to, in 18, 20 years, you're going to have probably a 15 to 20 foot tree. What is the, you know, the, the, the diameter of that look like? I can't really answer that, but it's going to be big enough that you could harvest it. Of course, cherry's not on here. Why is cherry not on here? Are there no cherry trees in Missouri? I don't believe that. I'm probably looking right past it, but um, some of these fast growing trees, like sycamore is a fast growing tree. I can vouch for that personally. I have an enormous sycamore in my yard. That thing grows like a weed. Um, black locust, we know that. That grows like a weed as well. It's also very invasive. Just make sure it's not illegal in your state. Blackberry is a fast growing tree. Cherry bark oak, fast growing tree. Eastern cottonwood, that one I knew very fast. Um, several different oaks. Osage orange is a fast growing tree. Very interesting. And that one's got a really, really wide range. You can find Osage orange like practically anywhere in the country. That could be kind of cool. And it would certainly would stand out from the cherries that you're growing. Um, oaks, 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 oaks. Most oaks are fast. River birch is fast. Um, silver maple, that's a fast growing one. Um, white oak, however, is a slow growing tree. Um, so there's quite a few in here. Um, poplar is definitely a fast growing tree. But... Um, you know, with these ideas of, of one to two feet a year, and you've got 20 years, I do think that it's possible. Now, what kind of upkeep? Certainly the major upkeep is going to be getting it to take in that first, first couple of years. The upkeep, you know, you're growing a lumber tree here. So you're going to want to prune those low branches. The minute branches start to pop, you're going to want to prune them off so that the canopy establishes itself higher up. Um, you need to figure out what does the land look like now. You already have cherry trees going around there. How much sunlight makes it to the ground? In other words, how shade tolerant does this tree need to be? You've got cherry trees growing already. Those are shade tolerant trees. So you probably have um, a f some sunlight coming down, but not that much and the cherry tree is growing okay. So the cherry might be all right. You do need to think about that though. Like that little tree, if it's growing up in a stand of established trees, might struggle if you don't plant the right tree. Pruning it so that you get a nice long straight bowl. Um, after I would say probably five years, I think the majority of the upkeep will be gone. You might wanna do some continued pruning kind of in the eight to 10 foot realm off the ground to make sure that you continue to get a nice straight bowl and the canopy drives up. But really beyond that, um, it's going to be hurry up and wait. So um, good luck, Brian. I'd be really curious to find out um, and, and, you know, consult with like a local arborist as well <clears throat> and ask them what trees are going to grow well in your particular area in New Hampshire. I can tell you cherry trees grow great up there. So do walnut trees. Um, I get a lot of walnut from that area. I got a lot of oak from that area and a lot of maple from New England, of course. So um, cherry, walnut, oak, maple, poplar, they're all going to do pretty well up in your neck of the woods. 
interesting question. I hope you're successful with it. Um, that'll be really cool. What a cool thing to say. And here you go, son or daughter. I planted this tree when you were born. Now it's a chest. <laughs> That's very cool. Um, Bob wrote in, and this resonates me with a couple of our recent episodes. He says, I've got Buckeye trees, lots of them. People around here in central Ohio say they're no good for working wood as the wood, the quote, quote, the wood doesn't last. Is this true? What does it mean? I'm picturing a cabinet or other piece slowly fading away. <laughs> uh, yeah, you got to love that. And this goes back to um, the idea of, of people saying this wood's no good. Well, maybe it's no good for what it was originally planted for. Back to like the, the gum uh, discussion in San Diego. It was planted by the railroad companies and it was no good for railroad ties. So that now it's got this reputation of being no good. So why are they saying Buckhead is no good? Well, it's not a particularly pretty tree. It's kind of bland. Um, buckeye burl, I mean, there's lots of it. It's, it's prone for, to burls, so that can be its own thing. I've turned a whole bunch of buckeye burl into bowls and pins and salt and pepper shakers and things like that. Um, but the non-burl stuff, it's pretty much just kind of a creamy colored, very, um, very little graining to it at all, but it's quite soft. Um, the Janka hardness is around 350 which is actually softer than Western red cedar. Density is incredibly low. Um, more importantly, it's not a particularly stable tree. The tangential to radial ratio is 2.3, you know, one being like isometric, not really moving at all. That's a pretty high number. Um, and that's because of that low density. There's a lot of, of softer wood, low density, and, and it's going to be spongy and absorb moisture a lot more. And it's going to flex and move around quite a bit more. So that can be an issue. But does it mean it's no good for woodworking? I mean, structurally, it may not be like the best wood for building, you know, load bearing structure. But could you use it in like a panel in a framing panel door? Absolutely. Could you use it as a drawer front or something? Could you even build a decorative box out of it? Could you build a carcass out of it? It depends on the load on it, right? So if you have it, you've got lots of them and you can get it in a harvestable lumber. Um, you know, if you're not paying an arm and a leg for it, I say give it a shot. Um, you know, again, it's not the most exciting of woods, but with that kind of very bland color, you might be able to do a lot of coloring to it. With that low density, it's certainly going to take dye and stain quite well. So you never know what you could do with it. I personally say anytime somebody says that wood's no good, to me, that's almost like a challenge. <laughs> Let's see what it's good at. It may not be good at whatever that guy had experience with, but it's probably good at something. It's wood, right? It took a lot of time to grow, so respect it and try to make something out of it. Good luck with it, Bob. Um, Nick. <clears throat> wrote in, he says, I'm interested in trying to do some thermally modified poplar on a small scale for personal use. I know most will say it's not possible, but what do you think? Are you familiar with the pro enough with the process to suggest a way to start? My biggest concern is getting an oxygen-free environment and what to replace it with. Uh, Nick, I'm a little concerned. Um, <laughs> this could be, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm quite familiar with the process and depending on which product you look at, there's more than just, you know, raising the temperature really high. Torrefaction is sucking the oxygen out and raising the temperature really high. And by reducing the oxygen, you're preventing the wood from combusting. So you can raise it up to really, really high temperature, um, you know, without it turning into flames. And that actually causes a chemical modification. You almost get like a crystalline lattice structure that forms. So torrefied wood is rot resistant, pretty much waterproof and incredibly stable. Very, very little movement at all, and it's also isometric in that it doesn't have that differential and tangential and radial. A lot of thermally modified wood, also while it's in the vacuum chamber, they inject a resin. So they, they bolster it even more by having a resin or something or even a chemical infusion in, in that vacuum environment in order to create an even more durable, even harder type product. So ultimately, you've got to have a vacuum chamber um, to otherwise you're just going to turn it into a fire. And, and with um, even a little oxygen, you'll get some combustion. That's how charcoal briquettes are made. Um, so in order to get usable lumber, you almost have to remove all of the air entirely. So yeah, depending upon the size of the board you're trying to do, that's a real problem. And you're injecting a whole lot of heat 
which if the vacuum fails and air rushes into that really, really hot wood environment, you could have like almost a bomb at that point. So you got to be really cautious here. This is something that I would not recommend anyone trying unless you've got like, you know, a back 40 acres that you can put your little vacuum chamber in and like dig a trench around it and like, you know, start it going and like run away <laughs> because if, if you're not certain that you can hold that vacuum and you're not certain how long to do it, there's going to be some failure, certainly. And failure could be like catastrophic, um, like turned into a blazing fire. So, yeah, um, you can research the process quite a bit to figure out how it's done. But ultimately, it's going to come down to getting a good, strong vacuum chamber that you can rely on. So I don't know that that's something that's really commercially available, unless you're talking about pin blank sizes, and then you might be able to come up with something that would work there. Moving on, um, Edmund has a great question. Nobody's ever asked this question. I was really glad he did. He says, in terms of wood movement, is a theoretically zero degree flat song board going to move as much as a 90 degree quarter sawn board? assuming the same perfectly straight tree, etc., to reduce variables. My understanding is that normal seasonal wood movement in wood that has reached equilibrium moisture content is primarily due to change in the amount of bound water. So if all the wood cells in both radial and tangential planes are the same, what explains the difference in movement here? So why is wood anisotropic? Why does it move more tangentially than it does radially? And, and Edmund's right. It, it's, it's about bound water. So if it's at equilibrium and there is, say, equilibrium is 9%, so 9% of water in those wood cells, why are they moving differently? It's a structural thing, Edmund. A couple things going on here. First and foremost, the cell walls are not the same thickness all the way around. So, you know, we look at the ingrain of a board and, and we can picture kind of fibers in like a straw broom, like an all stacked it there, a bunch of straws. And we think of those straws as little round things. So the cell walls are these little circles. If those cell walls were of, uh, of even thickness all the way around, they're going to contain um, not only the same moisture all the way around, but they're going to have the kind of same compressive and, and expansive nature, the same tensile strength to them. But they're not. Um, they are thicker in some areas and thinner in other areas, specifically thicker in the radial direction, Wait, wait, I might be wrong there. Now I can't remember. I might be reversing it. In the radial direction, the wood is not moving as much because it's more resistant. It's stronger. It doesn't stretch quite as much. Um, the tangential direction, the wood fibers are a little bit more pliable and they will stretch a little bit more and they're, they're allowed to expand and contract more. I can't remember, honestly, if that means the walls are thicker or thinner, but they're different. So they're going to, they have a, a different force factor, force number on them for compressive and, and expansion strength there. The next thing is, and this one makes a lot more sense because uh, we can see it, the rate, the medullary rays, the radial lines that run through that add structure as well. And those rays are jam packed full of tree waste, essentially extractives. As the tree, the sap layer extracts the nutrients for life and what's left over gets packed into those medullary rays and transported into the center of the tree, into the heartwood of the tree. So those medullary rays are very dense and they're kind of, again, like spokes on a wheel. They form the structure and think about a wheel. Um, without those spokes, the wheel is quite flimsy. The spokes provide the stiffness of that wheel. So the medullary rays are those spokes and they are jam packed full of a very, very dense material. They are going to restrict the wood's ability to expand and contract along the, the radial plane, which is why wood moves substantially less in that radial direction than it does in the tangential direction. The rays are not holding back the tangential movement, whereas the rays are restricting any expansion contraction of those individual cell walls in the radial plane. That one to me makes a lot more sense because you can see the structure, we can picture the spokes on a wheel and understand that a lot more. You gotta get really, really down to the microscopic level to look at the cell wall thickness, but believe me, that might actually play more of a role than the spoke medullary ray thing, but both of those come into play, which is why the wood is anisotropic. Very good question, a very geeky question, and what a great question to end the show on. 
So thanks, everybody. Good questions this week. A wide variety of questions. Lots of talk about Russian birch. It's going to make everybody happy. Well, it's not going to make people happy because it wasn't a good answer. But certainly, I addressed the question. So thank you to everyone who's been emailing me and DMing me about you know the plywood thing. I wish I had a better answer for you, but hopefully that will answer the 30-some the emails I got today and probably the 15 I got while I was recording this show. Thank you all for the interest, and hopefully we'll see some clear up in that market soon. In the meantime, let's take advantage of the hardwood market and not worry about plywood for a while. So go buy some lumber, maybe reclaimed lumber, maybe hardwood lumber. Maybe it's a tree that you planted 18 years ago when your son or daughter was born. It doesn't matter. Go use it. Thanks for listening, everybody.